we've also dedicated it as Happy Awareness Week, not just around the new build of our accommodation, but also how we adapt and retrofit our existing stock for an aging population. And again, this afternoon session is the first really of the session of this week, which looks at those principles and how we've done that in a very localized way. So again, I'm delighted to, to invite Yvonne as chair and obviously as chief executive, John, Johnny Johnson. So over to you, Yvonne. Thanks, Jeremy, and um, thanks for the introduction and, and welcome everybody. And I understand we've got a really, really big crowd today. So that puts uh, a little bit of pressure on us, which is excellent. Um, what we um, what we are, if you don't know Johnny Johnson, a specialist in independent living, we're spread across the north um, and we have our USP of Astraline, which will be covered in the, uh, the presentation. And also we have a USP around the armed forces. It was Mr. Johnny Johnson that set up the housing organization just over 50 years ago. Um, so what we've got is adapting homes for the 21st century. And we're going to cover um, Catherine, um, who's our director of homes and services, will cover um, new homes and existing homes and some of the remodeling work that we've done um, and support around dementia friendly schemes. We've got Joe as our director of Astraline and Innovation around technology enabled care and some really good insight into some key partnerships that I know uh, are being shared um, across uh, the housing lane. And then we have uh, the fantastic Laura Woods from Invisible Creations. I know many of you will know Laura. Um, I'm very much truly around dignity in our homes um, and adapting homes so that people can stay in them for, for a lot longer. So what I'd like to do, we, we, we try, and make this, um, try and make it interactive. We try and break it up a little bit. So Catherine will speak first and then I'll see if we've got some questions in the Q&A. So any questions you've got, if you pop them in the Q&A, um, 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 I'll keep my eye on the chat as well, but we've got some videos as well as some presentations. Um, and then we'll stop and have a few questions. Then we'll go on to Joe, have a few questions on to Laura and then open it up for more questions. I know we're here till around half five and I just want to say a massive thank you for uh, staying with us on this Thursday evening. So I'll um, um, bring Catherine to the floor and um, please take it away. Thanks Yvonne, it's lovely to be here. I'm gonna now uh, attempt all the technology. So I'm just gonna get the presentation up for us. So just bear with me a second. We've got the video up at the moment, ready for whenever you're ready, Catherine. Okay, do you want to just play, play the first video for me, Lois, please? Great, great, Lois. Thank you. So, so this is a this is a video from our scheme of the future, and our ambition around this was to set the designs which would nice and size of the apartment that we have, including a, sort of a new look of freshness. Um, you know, described space standards, accessibility requirements, but also taking into account the the acceleration of smart tech and smart building innovations, hopefully to benefit and support residents of Johnny Johnson in the future. We've also been looking at a new strategy um, in terms of how, how, how we come about our common areas. We know our, our existing common areas aren't really fit for the future, but when we're looking at this, this new style, we want to see how we can have this neighborhood hub, which will provide social and learning and leisure activities for people to engage in. You can see here the, the, the quality of the apartments. We've also been taking a look at what space looks like in these apartments. As you see, the camera turns around now. We've all been here this year, haven't we, in terms of working at home. Um, and, and as people age and as people, um, as, as people change, the pandemic has changed us all. But we're really thinking about what the scheme of the future will look like for us. So I hope you've enjoyed um, this little fly through here. This should just cut out now. And then I've just got a couple of um, stills to, to share with you. Bear with me a second. Okay. So there are the stills there. And as you can see, really, really smart designs, real, real good innovative way of, of how to really bring you know buildings to life. We really want to create that that hub design. 
and that's great, isn't it? But we've also got 5,000 residents and we've also got to think about how we, how we look at retrofit for the future. So I'm going to play you a second video now. And this is around um, understanding how we deal with our studio apartments. And for Johnny Johnson, we had a proportionately quite a high number. So maybe 700 within our stock. And Matt Platt is just going to do a, a quick Homes Under the Hammer style video for you here, which is around what we've done with our studios. And this is one in, in Stretford in Manchester. Um, so this was a, a studio which would just be, you know, a one room environment. Um, and we've made this into a one bed, uh, beautiful home. And we're getting really, really good feedback from, from residents um, who are living in these new adaptations. So look out for the Invisible Creations things in here. Um, uh, Laura's smiling there. I think this is the first live one that we've got for you, Laura. Um, but I hope you enjoy this one again, just, just, just over a minute. Uh, and I think that the video tells the story of where we are in terms of our creation around studios and, and how we're making them fit for the future. So if you just want to play that for me, Lois, that'd be smashing. Everybody, I'm at Perfect. In Northwest, where this week we are taking handover of this property back from our contractors for autumn. The work that's been undertaken is to convert from a studio into a one bed home and the quality of the product is absolutely fantastic and I'm really pleased to be able to show you around. I mean, you can see, um, you know, it's got, it's got, it, it's just fantastic. I'm, I'm, re I'm really, really proud of, of, of what we have achieved here. As you see, as the camera turns around, you'll see that we've, we've got a really open plan design kitchen, eye level um, cooking facilities and fridge freezer. All this has been from resident feedback of how they'd like to see the homes, taking a lot of feedback. One feature you won't see here, but it's just around the corner in storage compartment, is a digital stock tap. Again, our elderly residents have, have, have really fed back to us that they have a lot of trouble with stock taps. Um, so we've got a digital one now. This is the pocket door that goes into the, the new bedroom design. Um, what we've also done here is a full rewire. We've also future proof in terms of compliance. It's got LD1 smoke and heat protection throughout the entire apartment. Here's the invisible creations, Laura. I'd expect a big smile here, full pack um, in, in, the, in the assisted bathroom so again a home a real home for life for somebody here who moves in um no white grab rails um all very dignified and we are absolutely delighted with with what we've got here so yeah it's been uh, it's probably our fourth iteration this um but we're really really proud of it and all designed off, off resident feedback this transformation and we look forward to many more in the future thank you Thanks, if you just unshare, I'll just go back to mine. Okay. Okay, so we can we can talk about buildings and we have done slightly and I'll, I'll answer some questions on them, I'm more than happy to. But one one thing we, that we know I has happened this year- I interrupt you, Catherine. I don't think I can, we can see your Green. So what I'll do is I'll share your I'll share your slides. And if you just, right. wanna... just say I'm sharing. So oh, can see that. it, but on we can see it, but on slide view uh, on slide view rather than the big screen. Yeah. Are we any better? It, it's still on slide um, the slide show uh, view rather than the sort of full screen view. Let's maybe flip from the beginning. Doesn't seem to be working, sorry. Sorry. Do you want me to just stop and then Yeah, I'll just I'll get the map now. Okay. From slide four, please, Lois. Yeah. So. Okay. So yeah, yeah. we just back one, this one. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah, brilliant. So we we we've, we've talked about our our aspirations for our new build properties, and we've also talked about you know how we're going to retrofit, especially around our studio designs. But what we've been really clear about this year is understanding what the resident impact is, both for residents who will come in 
in the future and residents who are residing in the properties that we own and manage now. So the slide there understands what success looks like. So for us, we're wanting to see increases in satisfaction. We're wanting to see inc increases in people's well-being. And that's all around designing. And you'll notice from the slide at the start, a new deal for residents to make sure that the services that we're offering, that actually where people live, are A, what people want, and B, can actually increase those areas of well-being. So if you could just move to the next slide, please. So taking all that into account, we need to ensure we use our buildings better um, by creating the community hubs, by understanding what a digital infrastructure means. And, and Joe will talk more about this now, but we, we're very, very clear that digital um, will provide many, many opportunities um, for, for Astraline, but, but more for the residents and that home for life and making sure we've got that link to technology enabled care. I don't wanna steal your thunder on that, Joe, so I'm just gonna skip through that. Um, but, but we've got buildings that we've got to make sure are fit for the future. So as much as we've got the, the, the fancy things that I can show you, we've also got other things that we've got to take care of um, and making sure that techs and compliance run alongside each other. And I'm sure you all know that we have to make um, our 30 year business plan stack up through that. So it's really, really important to us that what we're doing and the service that we're providing and offering stands up for customers in terms of choice and quality, but also financially to them but making sure that we're fit for the future and everything that um, digital and tech has to offer. I've just got a last couple of slides just to flick through. Um, we're currently developing our new app, which will go live in March of next year. And it's around um, loads and loads of different principles, but just a couple of slides just to give you a flavor of, and these aren't the actual, this is just a, a mock-up. Um, so I'm, I'm not sharing anything that um, you'll see in the future. This is just a mock-up of what we shared with our residents. What I will say is it's been um, quite dramatic to understand what people want. And we've spoken to people who were in their 80s or in the 90s around digital. Um, and one of the things that they were really, really keen to understand was around um, a capability function that we're hoping to launch within the app, which is around a service for the next of kin or a friends and family, making them a VIP person around that app. Um, so again, we might have people who are um, digitally challenged in terms of their abilities to use that, but it doesn't mean that their friends and family cannot be involved in that and help them along in that journey. So we're, we're, we're really gearing up to, to launch that sort of summertime next year, proof of concepts being built as we speak. So if you just flick to the last slide, this just talks about um, my community. And again, this is a, a feature of phase two of our app. We want to ensure that people, you know, able to combat loneliness and isolation. We know um, our model at the moment, our independent living model needs to be modernized. Um, and this is just one of the areas that we're looking to do. So that's a bit of a whistle stop tour uh, in terms of our services and our buildings. And I'm happy to take any questions. Brilliant, thanks very much, Catherine. There is uh, a few questions come through. Um, I'll quickly say them and then I'll come back to, uh, the, there's one around wheelchair access. Um, one about what's putting um, bed sits together to create one bed and one around ventilation and a good comment. Thank you very much from Elaine Hollerhead. Thank you. Good to see the inclusion of pocket doors and, mount and wall mounted ovens. So, yeah, absolutely. So come back to the first one, Ronnie and um, Brian. Thanks, Ronnie. Uh, says it looks beautiful. It doesn't seem to have enough space for wheelchair access or turning points. So are some of them going to be slightly different for wheelchair users? Yeah, there, there is there is um, different designs and different opportunities. And that's why we're working with residents on feedback around that. Um, there will always be um, opportunities to make make sure that that, that they are designed properly. Um, but like I said, this is our fourth iter iteration on this, this particular model within the studio. Um, but as, as we go through, we'll make sure as we go through the schemes. One thing I should have mentioned, actually, we're not taking blocks of schemes. So these are being done when properties become empty. So there's an opportunity, um, especially for that person going into the property. Uh, but also, you'll have seen with, with what we've done in the bathrooms around independent living um, and invisible creations. But you're absolutely right. We still need to do that work and make sure that we've got full accessibility where we can. Yeah. Thanks, space. Catherine. 
And um, from uh, D Damien, um, so uh, Damien Utten, at the studio, at the studio flat conversion, is the bedroom internal, so no external windows. Yeah, how is it ventilated and are there issues with the fire, fire officer uh, with this being an internal room? Yeah, so good question. All the things that we've worked through. So um, like I said, this is our fourth iteration. So we have, um, I, I don't think it showed it in the video. So there's um, a ceiling fan. They are internal, the walls. It wouldn't have stacked up financially for us to move um, all the services across. So we did look at that in terms of design, uh, but it wouldn't have stacked up financially. We, we've got six residents living in these new ones and we're taking constant um, feedback and making sure people are you know, comfortable in there because I, I absolutely get your point. Um, but that's why we put the pocket doors in. That's why we put the ceiling fan in. We've got no problems with the fire officer because we've got an LD1 um, alarm, a heat and smoke alarm fitted throughout the property. So, so there was no problems. They're fully compliant. Brilliant. Thanks, Catherine. And um, Una um, Goldsworthy, thanks for your question. It says, hi, Catherine. Did you put two bed sits together to create a one bed? This is this is like magic stuff, isn't it? No, we didn't. It's a, that's the existing one. I will say um, most of our bed sits are convertible, um, not as in you can take the top off, as in you can convert them into the, the one bed. Um, but there are a few that are too small to do. Um, and, and those are the ones that we will have to take a view on whether we make them two properties into one. Uh, but I think at last, I think it was about 70 percent are we can actually convert. So we will do um, by taking the feedback and also an opportunity to raise the rent. Brilliant. And um, just a couple of other questions coming in. Rachel Wooden, just wondering about the use of shower trays ra rather than using level, uh, I can't speak, level access showers. I think this is some of the legacy, is it, Catherine? Yeah, I, I think, you know, where, where we are with that at the moment is, um, that's the design that we've got. We're taking feedback from customers. Like I've said, um, if we get in a position where we've got 30 or 40 bed sits in a scheme, studio, sorry, that then get converted into a one bed, there's no reason why we can't um, make them it, it, you know, accessible in a different way. But that's the design that we've chosen at the moment. Great, thank you. And a uh, question around ventilation. We might have already answered this and, and Jana, maybe did you look at MVHRs for ventilation and air circulation as there no windows? So um, that was where you were saying about your um, ceiling fans, Catherine, wasn't it? It is, but the, the, we have been looking at that, and it's something that we might look at in the in the next one that goes in. But we, we we're always looking at ways to improve it, so it's not something that we haven't looked at. We're just trying to one make it stack up financially and to make sure it's fit for the future but they're all very valid comments and things that we're looking at brilliant put myself off on you um one for yeah Ruth, Ruth thank you for that it's a pity you won't be sticking with all 10 happy criteria for all the apartments just as those you just described and it's a real challenge for us as Catherine's been saying um because you're working with um, you're working with current structures and um, so I think there's been a lot done for what we can with the space but yeah um, it, they won't all um, as you quite rightly say comply with the happy criteria we've got a comment John thank you I love pocket doors should be used more and um, consider contrasting colors in the bathroom um, would help with visual impairment yeah thank you Joan for that um, and then uh, just two more. I'll come back to Ronnie. Um, Ron, um, Ronnie's saying that's fab and invisible creations accessories looking good. Elaine, um, second question. Do you, did you have an interior designer, Catherine, and an occupational therapist as advisors on your design team? Um, well, we've certainly been looking at it through uh, on, the new, on the new build, but like I say, on, on the retro stuff, Put my hand up. We haven't we haven't had an, an OT uh, in terms of designing that, but we have been working with our own internal people. Um, you know, who, who do the design. So, yeah, I mean, I think we have to take on board uh, the comments, but I think that, that those are our designs as as they stand at the moment. 
Yeah, great. And were the end users identified before the layouts were designed? That, that That's a, a no because they're existing um, voids. But as Catherine said, um, uh, that um, users, we've got user feedback and, and have changed each model that we've looked at. So I think just um, Mike, Elam, and then we're going to go on to Joe. Internal bedrooms, surely not. And shower trays, I can't believe it. Thank you, Mike. Keep things coming through on the chat. Keep things coming through on the Q&A. So we're going to go over to Joe now, um, all around um, Astraline, Technology Enabled Care, and a key part is all the partnerships that we're um, testing things out with. So Joe, over to you. Brilliant. Thanks very much, Yvonne. I'll just do my little bit now where I get into screen sharing. Just give me one moment. We'll give Catherine a rest now. <laughs> <laughs> and just, uh, okay, that should be uh, should be starting to come into view. There we go. Perfect, Joe. Right. Excellent. Thanks very much, Yvonne. So, um, yes, hello, everybody. Um, I, I, this is the second one of these I've done recently, and uh, it is uh, it's a, a really interesting kind of experience because you're you're sitting up in your bedroom all day and you're doing your work, and uh, you know suddenly now at the end of the day I'm live to 200 or so people. So it's uh, yeah, as Yvonne said, it's a it's a it's a sort of challenging sort of um, you know thing to thing to thing to do. So um so yeah, so uh, my my role really I'm I'm the exec director for Astraline and Innovation at Johnny Johnson. And um, Astraline is a business unit within Johnny Johnson. And we've got a, a strong history of working um, with Johnny, Johnny Johnson in this space, in the technology enabled care service space. So what I'm gonna be talking to you about today um, is really um, how at a really detailed level, we've worked with our residents within Johnny Johnson and really taken a service design approach to, to, to really think about the needs and the wants and the desires of the residents in our property so that we can think about the types of products and the types of technology enabled care services that we can provide. So um, on the screen, you'll see a bit about Astra. I'm not gonna whiz through all of this, but what the, all I'm just demonstrating here is, as I say, we're, a, we're an alarm receiving center We've been within Johnny Johnson for 20 years. We were founded in 2000. Johnny Johnson obviously has been in existence for 50 years, celebrated its 50th birthday last year. So this is just really some uh, detail about us and just demonstrating, I guess, the scale at which we're providing services nationally and the types of conversations and the types of interactions that we have you know, on a, on a national level. Right, okay. So I'm just gonna advance, right? Okay. So, um, so when we think about um, the work that we're doing, when we think about um, you know, designing, developing the product offer for our residents and, and that technology enabled care service, um, we've been doing a lot of work this year thinking about um, you know, what are the trends we've seen you know, through the pandemic, we've seen an absolute um, shift really, a shift towards digital that we in our own lives as workers you know working uh, for organizations have shifted to digital in a way I would say that we just would not have thought possible a year ago and at a level where you know we're all we're all working in a digital way um, but what we're also seeing I would say is you know that potential and that in reality that real digital divide that's opening up you know for customers and for residents because you um, you know, we, we, we would say in the, at this moment in time, really digital and being digitally um, capable or having digital skills is, is a must have that the pandemic has really demonstrated that. So some of the themes and trends I would say that are driving their, the, the work is around the digital, um, the digital change and the digital switch that's happening within the sector. We're moving away from all of the analog PSTN infrastructure that served the country for the last hundred years and we're moving towards a digital future where 
all analog communication will end and everything, all protocols and all communication we do will be across a digital, um, you know, will be across a digital channel. So that's a really big theme. We're also seeing a lot in terms of isolation and what's developing around the stay at home economy. We think that will be a future for, for many years to come. So these are just some of the things that we're constantly thinking around and they're driving some of the post-COVID work that we as an organisation, both as Astraline and Johnny Johnson are doing and th really thinking how can we look, you know, we look through this lens and, and, and think about the services that not that just that our customers need today, but that they'll need tomorrow and into the future. And I think Catherine's presentation really articulated that that opportunity and that vision that we're trying to set for for the home of the future and what that could mean. So, um, so yeah, as we as we think about the customer, I think it's useful to talk about you know uh, the mo where where we've come from, the moment that we're in with with our current customers and really thinking into the future what are the needs and wants and aspirations of that customer of the future if we roll back five years um you know we think some of the themes that people were you know we as a, you know uh, housing organizations were into we were really thinking about starting to think about our customers but ultimately about providing a safe secure home and being a really good quality responsive landlord that starting to engage with their residents in a very different way, starting to, to have that conversation and starting to think about how can we, um, you know, provide services in a way that's, that's more uh, tailored to, to the needs of the individual. You know, five years ago, communal Wi-Fi was obviously, you know, uh, organisations were introducing communal Wi-Fi. So if we, if we then roll forward now to the, to the customer of the present, what is that customer looking for? You know, what is the JJ customer looking for? I, I'd say that the what the customer's needs have really shifted in some areas significantly over the last year. So um, Wi-Fi is, is really, you know, almost needs to be an ever present. And Catherine talked about how we're, you know, we have Wi-Fi across all of our schemes. They want to know that their landlord or their organisation has a plan for the analogue switch off that's happening in 2025 they'd like to see that their their landlord understands the digital divide that's opening up and the potential for um exclusion and digital exclusion so at johnny johnson you know we work very closely with our digital officer phil you know and we're doing a lot of work this year really trying to start to breach that divide how can we connect with our residents virtually but how can we upskill and how can we you know, provide skills and develop uh, our own residents so they're able to take advantage and full advantage of the opportunities that are coming down the track. They're also looking for affordable and reliable technology enabled care services and they're looking for people who are knowledgeable and can want, can install that, you know, in a, in a COVID secure way. You know, as an organisation, we've seen um, quite a bit of change to the way in which we install equipment so we do things at arm's length more you know we post out devices to to people but or our technology enabled care team they'll they'll come to people's property they'll put the property the the device outside just like your amazon delivery person would and then you know they'll ring the they'll ring our resident or they'll ring the customer and they'll talk them through how to install that device i mean we're quite fortunate to work with a number of suppliers that um, have introduced you know voice voice operated installation instructions and very much move into a plug and play approach with a lot of those people are looking for service to you know thinking about service design and user engagement and a big piece of the work we've been doing is really trying to understand our users and our our, our um, own residents as users of service and how can we respond to them so i'm going to talk a bit more about that shortly and also people want to know that, you know, the types of services that they provide is not just purely from the landlord, but recognising that there's often a network of responders of family, carers, landlord, and in the case of Astraline, a monitoring centre involved in the provision of those services. Rolling forward then for five years to the customer of the future. I mean, some of this is 
ambitious. I think I say this in the context, you know, if we were going to really provide, you know, that gold star service to our residents and our customers in the future, what would that look like? You know, a smart cyber home inclusively designed, you know, with the resident being involved in the actual design process and having input into that. We know that the digital switch is due to have happened by 2025, but also the, the, the wide scale rollout of um, gigabit broadband and also the upgrade to the 5G mobile phone infrastructure. So these are things that are, will give more of a platform and more of an opportunity for services to be delivered. People also will want clear expectations about the, um, what the technology is and what can it can do, what it can do. We come at it from the standpoint that it's very much an enabler. You know, the technology is not there to replace people. You know, we're always going to need people. People always want that human contact. And we've seen that more than ever over the last year, while it hasn't always been possible to, to deliver it. So people want that response, but they also want to be clear, you know, that we're not setting up expectations about the technology and the service around it. You know, so we're working with the residents and working with our customers. So last, last few points then for me. Um, so talking about that service design journey, um, we can think about service design as a methodology. It's an, a, it's an approach that is used really to, I would say to kind of try and tease out three things. When you're working in a service design way, what you're really trying to establish is, is the product or the service, is it usable, is it useful, and is it desirable? So is it, is it useful? Does it add benefit to the, to the customer or the resident? Is it usable? Does it work? Does it do what it says on the tin? And ultimately, is it desirable? Is it something that people want to use? Is it something that can be, become part of their, you know, everyday living and support them? So these just are some of the work that we've been doing over the last few years, working with Sheffield University, their catch team, to we developed a, um, a minimal viable product, a walking speed sensor, which we deployed into around 20 Johnny Johnson properties to, to look and try and monitor uh, for frailty by watching for deterioration in walking speed. This is the first time that um, continuous walking speed had ever been monitored in the UK. We work with our colleagues at M Habitat, who are so, service design um, specialists and who work um, with directly with the NHS and are co-located with the NHS in Leeds. And um, we're currently working with Cambridge University on a detailed piece of work. And I must give Jeremy and uh, the Lynn uh, team here a plug for the work that we're doing here. But we're working with Cambridge University back into our scheme at SPAY, where we're um, evaluating smart sensor, passive technology, but also wearables and voice activated devices. And that work is going to feed into the housing lens technology um, to aid our aging population, the TAPI inquiry, which I'm sure you'll be hearing a lot more about. So that just gives you a flavour of the, the work and the types of things that we're focused on. I'm going to ask Yvonne now to um, roll, the, roll the film, as it were. This is a project we did with the NHS Digital and the National Care Forum, and it talks in detail about the work that we're doing. So some different voices to me from here to hear from, but um, thanks for listening, and I'll be in the, the chat or the comments after my piece. Thanks, Yvonne. Thanks, Joe. Let's uh, see the video. I think it's just coming on now. I think so. Um, yeah, tenants thanks. found it really, really useful, um, especially with the daily welfare checks. Um, so at the moment, we actually call those individuals because the technology we currently have in situ doesn't enable us to call through the equipment. Um, so very much press the button and get on with my day. That was something really important for tenants. Um, they particularly um, liked the fact that it was kind of it was connected within the home. So the range of the pendant didn't matter. It connected to the base unit so they could hear somebody. Um, the additional sort of feeling of security, the peace of mind, knowing somebody was um, available if needed. Um, but also I think the um, promotion of independence and maintaining somebody's independence was really, really key. Um, so knowing somebody could help in an emergency, knowing somebody knows that you're all right every day and knowing somebody will no do something about it if you're not. But also 
um, if somebody had fallen, that they could actually um, summon for help um, because they were wearing a piece of equipment um, that would either they could activate or would activate for them. Um, the other thing as well was, was um, they particularly liked the fact that you could cancel false alarms. So if somebody's um, dropped it by accident, um, and within seconds, somebody from Astroline came through saying, are you okay? You had full sensors activated. And like, oh, I'm really sorry, I've dropped it. Um, so that was, that was you know, something that um, tenants found really beneficial. Um, I think from our perspective as a staff team, the ability to have checks that are automated, so testing um, of the actual equipment, that, that the connection was live and there was no faults on it. Um, and also uh, people particularly liked that the equipment was um, able to tell them when there was an issue in their home. So one lady had an issue with her uh, power socket and it told her there was an electrical fault. So without that piece of equipment, she wouldn't have known that and would have assumed that her uh, technology was working correctly. Um, so if she'd summoned for help, she may not be able to get that help she needed. Um, it also has sophisticated technology built in, like it knows if it's sat in a drawer and somebody hasn't used it, um, which again is, you know, is, is a massive benefit because we know um, a lot of people don't wear their pendants and accidents happen and somebody can't get the help they need because they're not wearing their piece of equipment. Um, so that would aid us as a staff team to have those conversations with people. Obviously, we've not been away on a week's sabbatical learning how to use it. It's very much learning on, on the go in some areas. Um, we've got some quite um, detailed instructions that were left by um, the installers. We've also got um, telephone advice from Time Tech should we require it. Um, the instruction manuals are very, very um, detailed. The basis of it is extremely simple and it's not unlike the old system. So um, that means that anybody that's used the old system will, with a little bit of training, um, not have a problem with it. Um, the information gathering and the digital side of it sort of sits in the background so it's not, it's not intruding on anything that's going on because it goes to sleep and it, it gathers all the information and it stores it so that if you needed to um, gain that information at some point, with regards to a resident, let's say that they're having lots of falls or they've suddenly become unwell, um, the pendant would have picked up that that person is falling quite a lot. So we can go back into the system and try and just look at the dates, the times, whether there's anything significant um, in that person's flat um, that may be the cause for the falls or whether it's something that we need to look at specialist um, assessment from GP um, or hospital um, and then we can notify family and they can take it up from there. Well, when we're using something like a GPS signal um, pendant or monitor, um, that's massively changed uh, because it allows people to be more independent, allows them to travel, allows them to um, play golf if that's what they like to do before. Uh, so yeah, I, that's that's made a massive difference to people. Um, if something happens to them, if they have a fall, then the, all they need to do is press the pendant, and we can locate them through via the GPS signal. Um, we can then alert the authorities, or and the families to find out, you know, to go and see if they're okay. Or we don't we don't respond to that, but we can alert a lot quicker than usual. I'm a bit nervous really because obviously we know how the the old tech works but now we've had a, a test run of some of the new tech yeah really really happy about it in fact looking forward to using it it's a lot easier i think and um if they have a pebble or um a chip tech go which is you know one of our products that yeah you, you can go off and do whatever they want to do go shopping for instance and still have the, the comfort of knowing that we are just at the press of a button I think it's made a massive difference, as in we're able to offer them a more varied product. So we've got lots of different types of equipment now, so it's more suitable for different, for different needs and it gives us um, better assessment value. So when we're assessing the customers, we, we've got better options to offer them. At the end of the day, people want to live in their own homes, they want to age in place, they don't want to be perceived as somebody that needs to be checked on. 
Um, so this for me is very much about um, increasing somebody's independence, but gives us the ability to step up with support when needed. Um, and that can, that can vary depending on somebody's personal circumstances at the time. Right. Any thank, final? <laughs> Sorry, Joe. Any final comments? Yeah, no, no. Th thanks, Yvonne. Um, I, you know, I, I wouldn't normally show such a, a long piece of video when I'm speaking, but it's almost like having a whole team alongside you. And uh, I think the value there for me is people that are actually working day to day. So our tech responder team that are going out, they're lifting people, they're responding. We're working with Northwest Ambulance Service. I, I do think that they bring a different type of insight and a, a different type of connectedness to, to the type of work that we're doing. So uh, I just thought it might be really useful for, for our audience just to hear that and perhaps hear, you know, directly from the horse's mouth, as it were. So um, that's why, you know, we ran that long, vid long video. But, um, hope Brilliant. That Thanks, Joe. And we always love to um, see and hear pa Pauline anyway. Um, we do. We've got a couple of, couple of things coming through, but please do keep them coming for, for Joe. Um, Margaret Edwards, thank you very much. It says, Joe, how do you determine which tech problems you will help with directly for residents and which you expect them to go to providers for assistance with? Oh, what a what a good question to get fired fired up on. So, um, I, I guess it's um, so we so thinking about about what we do in the background. So, I think um, some of the women that that spoke on the film about the variety of technology that we use, and we work with a lot of different suppliers. And what we try and do is have some uh, you know some uh, commonality in some of the things that we do. We don't just have you know one one piece of each type of equipment. So we have a broader range and the way in which I think we approach it is to start to think about the person's need so we use different types of things I mean we do use some kind of tools as well to help us to to make that assessment so we're starting really with the the kind of need that the person might have initially taking them through an assessment process and then ultimately you know presenting sort of options around what what type of technology we think you know would be most suitable for them so uh I think that answers the question, Yvonne. Hopefully, Margaret. If not, please do tap away <laughs> and we'll, and we'll, back, give, Joe, we'll give Joe another go on that one. Yeah, no, absolutely. <laughs> no, that <laughs> sounds good, Joe. And thanks, Ronnie. Yeah, we've got a fantastic um, tech team and absolutely the work that they do is, um, is really extremely um, resident and customer focused. Um, what are we? Oh, right. Hello, Joe. So this is from Vonne. This is not from me, Joe, just in case. This is from Vonne. <laughs> um, hello, Joe. Do you have predictive behavioral patterns software? We do. We do. Yes, we do. So, um, uh, yeah, we, we use a number of uh, uh, types of sort of predictive um, software. So we work with uh, a couple of key suppliers, House, um, you know, we've worked as well with Cascade 3D and uh, you know, that type of technology is just, for me, has come on by leaps and bounds over the last few years. Um, at Spay House, which you saw a lot of the filming and the videos from, we've installed that there into a show flat. This was obviously pre-pandemic. Remember that when you could actually go into buildings and you could take people on tours around around buildings. Well, we've installed that in there and that, that does a number of things. You know, it uses algorithms and it uses... AI and sort of pattern recognition. And so over a course of a few days, weeks, and um, because of where the sensors are placed around the property, there might be things like smart plugs. So they can tell things like activity, you know, when's the kettle going on, you know, when are other things happening in the, in the home, but also what's the movement and the ways in which that person is using the house. Are they going out much? Uh, when are they going out? When are they come back in it? coming back in and that really helps us to kind of build up a, 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 a perception and a kind of view of that person's lifestyle and what the appropriate intervention might be. Brilliant thanks Joe and um, Lois thank you very much um, for popping Joe's blog onto the chat there that's excellent and um, we've got a really good question a couple of questions around cost here now, Joe. So, how have you dealt uh, with the increased cost of digital? Has this mm. been passed on to tenants? So, and Dixo, thank you for your question. 
Oh dear, do you know, almost might get, have to get Catherine back in on this one. So, uh, <laughs> Catherine, <laughs> my exec colleague, she's a. Uh, I, I, I knew that was. I knew that was sliding off your shoulder, Joe, from Sheffield <laughs> down to Manchester. Yeah, I, I think it's a it's a really really valid comment. Um, and, and even if you think of service charges this year, I mean, we operate fixed service charges and we're debating at the moment around the pandemic and the additional money that we've had to spend this year to keep people safe. So that's just as an aside and what we might have to either charge or not charge next year. Um, from a digital perspective, we haven't charged for um, Wi-Fi in schemes as it stands. So we have communal Wi-Fi in all our schemes uh, and that's free to the customer that the business pays for that. Um, as we move forward, it's whether that bandwidth would support what we're talking about with techs. So we're having it, we're actually having a debate on Monday um, as an exec team around Wi-Fi and what the future looks like in terms of understanding, are we gonna be looking to offer that as a service or is that a step too far? Are we not the provider of Wi-Fi? Um, so at the moment, we're Wi-Fi compatible in all our schemes from, um, uh, 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 what's my train of thought, in, in the communal areas, but not in the apartments. We do have two blocks that have been built in the last sort of seven to 10 years that do have Wi-Fi, but that's paid for by um, the, the resident and they were new builds. So I think that's a little bit different to what's, what's in for retrofit. Yeah. Yes, yeah. thanks. Sorry, Joe. No, sorry, Yvonne. Sorry, I was just going to add on to that, you know, just, um, you know, additionally, I mean, some of these types of technologies are, are additional. And obviously, we've got people that are receiving care at, um, you know, at Spay House. So some of the additional things that people can have, obviously, if you've got your own budget and your own personal budget, you know, and, it, and you're getting a certain level of care, then, you know, within that, people are self-funding. So some of this, uh, you know, probably quite a, a proportion this is also targeted at um, self-funders. Yeah thanks Joe and Catherine and, and, and Ruth um, asked a very similar questions about whether service charges were going up and Catherine's right it's a hot topic um, I'd welcome in the chat room if anybody's having the same debate um, mm -hmm. we were talking about um, you know the potential really to have access to good Wi-Fi um, countries are talking about that as a human right aren't they and if yeah. we but, you know, we're on a session around a 21st century home and, um, you know, Wi-Fi is everywhere and, and phone connectivity is everywhere. And, and really, I think what we've got to um, incorporate into our discussions is how do we make sure that the digital agenda that we put into schemes brings about efficiencies? And Catherine's doing a lot of work around that um, if we can shift people to more of a digital platform some of you may may well really be down that line and again happy to really hear um hear how that's going i'm just going to ask a couple of more questions keeping my eye on the time and then i'm going to come into laura and we'll pick up any of the rest after so quick question joe from jonathan mitchell does the software that you mentioned use ai Yes, yes, it, it does. Um, that's not Jonathan from um, Salix Homes, is it? Anyway, there's so many people out there. But uh, so, um, yes, it, it does. So it, it uses um, pattern detection and it uses um, AI and machine learning. So so what it does is, you know, with the sense of technology, it, it's capturing, you know, constantly on capturing lots and lots of readings. And then within the background, you know, in the, in the software, it's analysing all that and processing that information learning and and adapting the sort of engine to really you know uh, come back come up with um, more of a sense of that person and, and what it does really i think is as it learns the um the patterns and the behavior of the of the resident or customer what it then does is look for exceptions and it will that's that's the advantage it looks when when the person doesn't get up or if the person say during the night is going repeatedly to the toilet say might suggest they have a UTI infection. So that's that's the kind of stuff that is smart stuff that it's doing outside of normal office hours. Great, Joe. And um, Von is just asked which supplier would you recommend who you who we have with our software? Um, yeah, I'm just wondering whether 
I like I loved Vonnie's things that were popping up on the bottom there and about our tech team and we celebrated our tech team. Our, they're an all women tech team and we celebrated them for International Women's Day this year. So uh, I don't know if Vonnie wants to get in contact with me separately. You know, we could have a separate conversation. Happy to do that. Brilliant, brilliant. That's great. And thank you again, Lois. Um, um, we've got the um, what's happening in Barcelona um, linked to the um, digital rights point. And uh, Ruth, yeah, very much agree. The Internet is a human right as a human right is very interesting, but not sure how it will work unless all provision is free. Um, quite right. And Bonnie's going to get in touch with you, Joe. I'm just going to saw that. Give a thumbs Excellent. up to Bonnie there, sir. So. <laughs> Excellent. We might turn just very, very quickly. I'm Dick so about the mobile technologies. The Pebble uses SIM rather than traditional analog. I mean, a lot of what we use at um, JJ and Astroline Joe is um, it, is digital, isn't it? It's not the old an analog. I don't know whether people are ready for that switch, but we certainly are there. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. It just that's the way that you can the device can be mobile and the person can be out and away from there home as opposed to a traditional analog device which you couldn't go more than 50 meters away from the uh, you know the hub and and i think carla you raise a really good point about um i mean you're in the far north of scotland and um, so have connection and quality issues i think that is a big challenge mm. for rural areas and I, and I believe um you know there is quite a there is quite a push to try and get um, that connectivity into rural areas across the, the country. Um, but um, yeah, right, I'm going to move on to Laura. Una, I'll come back to you. And Jonathan, not from Salix, but from Fathom Architecture. Sorry, <laughs> Jonathan, sorry. I think I may even got that name wrong, so <laughs> thanks yes, for the well, question. Let's, brilliant, let's thanks come over me. to Laura. Laura. Thank you. Just... Perfect, perfect, Laura. Awesome. Okay, so um, I'm Laura Wood from um, Invisible Creations and thank you very much for the little kind of shout outs that we've had earlier. It's really good to know that people are, are kind of aware of who we are and what we're doing, but for anyone that doesn't, I'll give you um, a background as to who we are, what we do and what we're trying to achieve. So uh, we started life um, back in 2018, um, back in the um, National Housing Federation's Greenhouse Programme. Um, and we started as um, a very simple idea um, and we're very lucky that we've been supported by um, three housing associations, Johnny Johnson Housing, Anger Hanover and Carbon Homes to actually turn the idea into a business which is now Invisible Creations. Um, and Invisible Creations is a business that specialises in providing accessible, attractive and inclusive products to support people to live more independently and well for longer. So. Our whole ethos at Invisible Creations is to design for dignity. And we create products that are designed to remove the negative stigma so often associated um, with assistive and accessible products. We believe that home should be a haven, not a hospital, and products designed to help you remain independent should be attractive and not clinical. So our initial focus has been to design adaptations that provide all of the function of a grab rail, uh, but with style and dignity at the heart. And we did this by working with a range of people, real people like my gran Sheila, who's featured in these photos, to really understand their needs, but also to understand their desires and their aspirations. We wanted to shift the narrative around aging and accessibility. And we wanted to create a business that centers around inclusive design, prevention and positive aging with people at the heart. And we found that millions of people, just like my gran, are refusing or delaying getting vital support to help them sit, uh, to help keep them safe because there's so much negative stigma attached to products for older people. These products are designed without people at the center. They're designed to fulfill a need and not a want. And why should your ability to have choice, to remain trendy and stylish, and to surround yourself with things that make you feel good diminish just because you grow older? It shouldn't. 
Um, but yet when you look around, when you look at what's on offer, it's ugly, it's clinical and it's stigmatizing. And we didn't like it. Sheila didn't like it. And we found that there were so many people across the country and actually across the world that felt the same as us. So we thought there's a real opportunity here to do something about it. So I'd like to um, share a video with you um, that captures all of this, that shows how important it is to keep innovating, keep challenging the status quo and to design products and services um, around people, but most importantly, with the people that use them. I'm going to pray that the video um, works. Hi, it's Laura here from Invisible Creations. Um, I'm just here at Shields now. We installed her rails um, earlier and now we're going to do a bit of a reveal so she gets to see them for the first time and I know she's super excited and everyone else is super excited to see her reaction. How's it going? So prior to um, this video being filmed, um, Sheila's home was actually filled with the clinical products um, and she had to get them installed and that was to allow her to return home from hospital. But as you can see, she hated them. Um, they had a real negative impact on her self-esteem, her dignity, and even her sense of safety. Uh, the outdoor grab rail, she used to complain quite a lot um, that it made her feel like she'd be a target for doorstep crime, um, that it labeled her as a vulnerable person. And we found that Sheila wasn't alone in this and that actually the products that are out there currently in the market have a very negative impact on people's mental health. And people care about the way that things look because it affects the way that we feel. So people don't want products, services or homes that remind them of lost mobility, um, that symbolise vulnerability, old age and disability. Their home should be a haven, not a hospital. And I think the images on this slide just show that actually accessible design really can be beautiful. And it was great to see them featured in person um, in the video earlier from Catherine to show that actually these are getting installed across homes, uh, which is fantastic to see. Um, and they're making such a big difference already. So we're collaborating um, with housing providers up and down the UK to change more lives just like Sheila to support people to live healthier and happier lives without compromising their dignity. And we're trying to shine a spotlight on how um, the housing sector thinks about adapting their homes. And we're working with housing providers to move to a model that places strategic installation, prevention and inclusive design at the heart. So for housing, housing providers, um, aids and adaptations are often just seen as a very operational task. People get adaptations installed generally after a crisis or a specific need has been identified. But very often this can be too little, too late. The damage is already done. Um, we wanted to change the narrative on this. So we presented um, how by adopting a more strategic approach, they could actually make a hugely positive difference to both their tenants' lives and their business models. So we present inclusive home adaptations as a part of a bigger vision for increasing the amount of age-friendly homes. There's a great potential for our products to be installed as a more preventative solution. And this is through things like new builds, voids, plan maintenance and bathroom refurbishment programmes, which ultimately will lead to more homes being safer and age friendly. And we're really excited to be working with many housing associations up and down the country. But Longhurst Group is an example of one of them. Um, and we're working with them on their new build programme to install um, our attractive dual purpose adaptations to support both their tenants and their business. Because we think, and thankfully Longhurst and a lot of other organisations think, that actually installing these support mechanisms earlier um, could prevent falls, promote mobility and help support people to live independently in their homes for longer. So there are clear health benefits to this approach, um, but there's also strong business benefits, um, including increased customer satisfaction, tenancy sustainability and potential cost savings. 
a lot of adaptations are ripped out and discarded once a tenant leaves the property and the cost seems insignificant because grab rails are so cheap but the cost of labor isn't there's a potential to save money on repetitive installation and removal costs if you install more attractive and inclusive products that can remain in homes even when a tenant moves away from that property and inclusive design has the potential to make all homes accessible. Um, this is actually a photo of, of my house modeling one of our products. Um, and that meant that my house became somewhere my gran was able to come and visit again. Um, and this has been a really positive outcome we've found amongst other families who've installed the products, making their homes more accessible for their relatives to visit. And, and just to kind of finish off, really, um, we're constantly striving to improve um, invisible creations and we recognise that, you know, we need to keep investing in continuous innovation, learning and development. Um, and with this in mind, we're currently working on a study to discover more about the impact of installing attractive and inclusive adaptations and what that impact is on an individual's physical and mental health. Um, and we're also working hard on developing more products to support people as they age or their needs change. Um, the current range that we've got is more of an early intervention range. Um, so it's more looking at getting that support in earlier and extending that independence for as long as possible. So if you'd like to find out more about the products, how you can get involved with the evaluation, or if you'd like to support us in our future product development, um, then please do get in touch. Thank you. Fantastic, Laura. Thank you. Thank you so much. And um, we've got here, Andrew um, Brown has got Invisible Creations adaptations in with some great feedback and keen to do more. So, so that's good. Right. We've got a fair few questions coming in and we've got plenty of time. I'm going to wrap up in around 15 minutes maximum. Um, so Sheila Peace, great to see Laura's work within mainstream general housing. Good to see more of the ideas in communal housing in general needs housing as well. Um, and gives us um, a really good insight here, special issue of the Journal of Aging and Environment, um, which covers off housing in, in USA, Sweden, Spain, Australia, and the UK. Thank you for that. And that links to the Royal College of OT um, which the Invisible Creations work with. Um, and so there's some more information there. Contact Sheila. Sheila, thank you for that. Mm -hmm. um, Suzanne's got a question. Curious to know why, despite the elegant rails, Sheila still has to get down a step. Would a gentle ramp and rail be more secure? Um, Laura, how are you with your installation of ramps? So one of the things that we found um, you know, most bungalows that have been built do have steps. Um, and it's a crazy thing to think that homes that have been designed specifically for older people were designed with a step uh, to actually make life more difficult. And I think one of the things, you know, we've started as a, a very small range of products to see how can we make an early intervention now? How can we get in quicker um, to provide that support? I think that the issue that we have with some of the kind of ramps um, is around cost. Uh, we know that everyone is very cost conscious so actually installing the um the rails is is that kind of like it's solution in between um a lot of kind of local authorities and housing associations want to be able to support their tenants but obviously it is always a balance between budget and um and, and the products that we can provide. Uh, we are looking at what other potential products and what other areas we can develop within the home and around the home. Um, so it's definitely something that's on our radar to see actually, is there some other intervention that we can put in place that would make it even easier than the current rails do? Brilliant, Laura, thank you. And um, Julia says, love the designs. Will you be going on Dragon's Den so you can scale up production now scaling up production is not a problem is it Laura no so um we've already um had quite a few shipments um of the products um and they are getting installed at the minute we've got two factories that that make products for us and a really great distribution and manufacturing partner um so we're actually already kind of in a position where we can offer large scale um products so um we're kind of we, we did a bit of a dragon's den uh, two years ago um, as part of the National Housing Federation's competition that, that they ran. Um, and we were really lucky that we've got the support of, of Yvonne and Johnny Johnson and Anchor and Carbon who have supported us to get to this point. Um, so we are already in a position to deliver, which is great. 
Yeah, so that, that's excellent. And Carla's asked Laura, um, I would like to know what do we have to do to include in our designs of homes to be ready for the Invisible Creations products to be installed? So one of the things that we found is that, you know, the installing the adaptations, they're only ever as good as the walls that you're installing them into. So I think something that often gets overlooked, especially in new build properties, is actually securing the walls to be able to take some of these adaptations. So one of the things that we're really trying to raise awareness of is to make the homes invisible creations ready, make them ready to be able to adapt them to support people's changing needs. Um, so one of them is strengthening the walls and making sure that you can put products like this in. Brilliant. And Amanda's asked a really good question because I know we're doing um, quite a lot of work on this. Is Are we using an outcome measure in our studies, Laura? If so, which ones? So um, we're only really early in the evaluation. So we're working with a couple of academics on this um, and we're looking at things from the, the cost benefit analysis. We're looking at social value. Um, so I'll be able to pass on more information in January on that once we start. Fantastic, thank you. And I think I saw something on the chat. Yeah, David Bagnall is loving the Sheila approved, don't we all? And Aspire, uh, Aspire Housing has already got some in. So Ronnie, thank you. Um, Lois, building on today's excellent happy hour session with another tomorrow morning on stylish refurbishment adaptations. So love to hear how that goes tomorrow. And um, um, uh, Jess, thank you for your um, comment around ramps. Um, have I got, and I think that might be, there's a ramp discussion going off. Um, mm -hmm. uh, th there's one here, and I think this is for possibly for Joe, possibly Catherine, really. I think it's a really good point, Una. Um, Una says we're struggling with local authorities disallowing tech and we want to introduce, um, that, that they want to introduce, while some other LAs allow it, and perhaps something for the sector, the NAP Fed, the Housing Link to, to lobby for consistency. So there is something about how that links into what's housing benefitable um, and, and what's allowed in people's homes. I don't know if Joe or Catherine have got anything to add on that one. Um, I, I suppose just wondering there, I mean, uh, when we're not allowing it, is this, um, I, I'm, I perhaps just need a bit more detail really, I'm not quite getting the the point, I think, because, uh, you know, are, the, are these local authorities in then through their nomination agreement, they're sort of making a point around it, just wondering at what point they're in the, in, in those discussions. Yeah, now I'm taking it. Go on, Jeremy. I think Una makes a really good point there strategically, and there is work being done behind the scenes. So I think uh, Joe and Laura referred to some of the work that Innovate UK are doing um, and looking at times how to accelerate, uh, how to scale some of this so that local authorities can have the reassurance that there's actually a value for money and cost effective. Wow. Uh, but there's also work that Centre for Aging Better are doing to make this much more of a retail offer as well. So it's not just about sort of housing benefit dependency, it's also Joe touched on the cell phone the market um, so there is there is a broad area here and part of i think the challenges we've got as a sector is that our aids and adaptations of technology have been very much dependency led rather than independency led so i think yeah. if we can change some of the culture that you talked about right at the outset upon that would really help and uh, we're part of the home coalition and that's the housing made for everyone and while a lot of the focus has been on accessible design in relation to the latest consultation on accessibility the purpose is so we can future proof our homes so they're adaptable as we age yeah, yeah. jeremy I, I just come in just to just a, a point to that so um so obviously the work through the tappy um you know we we you know we were obviously working with cambridge um university on that but we're also providing the digital solution for cambridge here county council so they've come to us we you know we want a contract with them recently and they're they're really focused on digital so they they were working with a lot of suppliers already some we were already working with we've introduced them to a number of others and uh, um, I've kind of what we're doing is, is linking up Cambridgeshire County Council with Cambridge University as part of the work that we're doing currently so there might be some sort of strength in that learning from Cambridgeshire's approach 
and just seeing if there's some sort of value, whether they could potentially become an advocate within that process. But, uh, you know, we could take that offline. But um, Cambridgeshire University were very keen that we made those links and we've started to do those. Well, uh, you, you've jumped the gun slightly, but I am delighted to say that the TAPI project, which will be formally announced, I hope, tomorrow, um, uh, has some links, very good links with Cambridge already. And there will be a viewpoint out tomorrow uh, from Gemma Burgess and Phil, uh, for Phoebe Sterling um, around some of their work and thinking. And I know Dunhill are, are part of that group as well. Brilliant. Thanks, Jeremy. Yeah. Well, thanks, Joe. Right, thank you. Just one last question that I probably haven't um, um, answered um, is um, from um, Anonymous, thank you. The products look great. How do these work in relation to regulations? Are there any building regulations, um, Laura, that this links to or not? No, so they've been tested against the same standards as current adaptations and um, gone through the same rigorous process. And we've actually gone over and above on a lot of hours. We've consulted with um, more independent parties to make sure that we've tested them to, to a, a different level to the current ones that exist. So um, they, they do comply with everything that we've, we've kind of gone through so far. Um, I don't know. I think there's an ISO testing, um, I, but I can send that information if, if anyone needed it. So, yeah, they, they do fit in with current building rigs. Great, thank you. And I think from the questions we've we've answered um, those. And um, yeah, so I would probably um, just wrap up Jeremy and, and um, pass over to yourself just to say thank you everybody for for the um, for the chat, for the Q and A's for getting involved in that. I think it's made a, a really interactive session and, and thank you to, to Catherine, to Joe and to Laura and Lois and team for helping us out with those videos and slides. And uh, thanks Jeremy for letting us um, share and learn from the audience. Well, thank you for your support and uh, it's been a great session and just picking up on some of the chat the questions and also some of the comments from you all uh, our happy hour series have been very popular this autumn and we've used that format here with laura saying there may be some research coming out and things why don't we continue the conversation in 2021 that'd be great well, thank you for all of your time have a good evening brilliant thanks everyone thanks everyone. thanks jeremy and lois thank you bye, bye.